Today, a conversation with Steve Keen, part two, from central bankers to MMT. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to his post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And in today's show, I continue my discussions with economist Steve Keen. Last time, Steve Keen went through the fundamental issues around debt and why credit's so important. But now, I want to take the conversation further. We've spoken about the Reserve Bank and some of their weird decisions. But what I want to know is, in your opinion, what's the role of entities like the Bank for International Settlements, I guess you could call them the trade unions for central bankers, or the IMF, or indeed the Financial Stability Board, the FSB? Are they all singing from the same hymn sheet? And therefore are missing the point about credit too. Is Bank of International true? Settlements is different. Right. And this actually, you'd like this reason because it yeah. comes down to one human being. Mm -hmm. That's Bill White. Okay. Uh, and Bill White was the research director of the Bank of International Settlements. He, and I'm, Bill's a friend now. We've met, we've met several times and he's one of my favourite people. Uh, but Bill found himself, uh, he's a conventional economist, got the job as the research director of the Bank of Ishnar Settlements, and then you know, he's handling all the data on money, and he's starting to read more broadly about money and cycles, comes across Schumpeter, and comes across Hyman Minsky. And starts reading Minsky and says, this stuff makes sense to me. I understand, this, this explains what I'm seeing. And, and I remember back when I was doing my contrarian stuff back in 2005, 2006, I'd read IMF reports and I'd be ready to burst out laughing. I'd read World Bank, same sort of stuff. I read the BIS and I start going to the cynical mindset and I think, <laughs> well, I could have written this, right? Who's this, who is this? And it was Bill White. And Bill was actually making warnings about an approaching financial crisis. So the one body that got it right was the Bank of International Settlements. And Bill, and to, I mean, I've never been in the situation. I hope I'd behave the same way as Bill did. But he would literally make speeches at the biannual meetings of all the central banks, which occurred at the BIS, in front of Greenspan, saying there's going to be a financial crisis. And, and basically, Greenspan just basically stared him down and said, don't listen to that guy. So the BIS was on the right side, but everybody else reads from the neoclassical hymn sheet. And like in the case of the um, IMF, uh, that includes Olivia, Olivia Blanchard, who was the research director yeah. of, the, uh, of the IMF. And again, somebody I've had relationships with now through email correspondence and so on. And I, I have a lot of respect for Olivia as a human being. Okay, But as one of my friends described him, uh, and I won't say who, he said, Olivia, if you want to have a drag race, Olivia is your man. If you want to turn a corner, he'll crash the car. <laughs> so he has this total tunnel vision, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, no role for credit, et cetera, et cetera. And, and those visions about how money is, is un, A, unimportant, but B, you can't let the government run deficits. You know, that's really bad. Um, that's, that's the same hymn sheet the World Bank sings from, the IMF sang from, uh, and the, the BIS was the only standout. And it's interesting, the BIS a couple of weeks ago actually made, I think, quite an interesting statement in their annual report, yeah. which was basically, you've got to be thinking about firing all the engines, not just the credit engine. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And basically saying there are other tools other than credit that are going to be required to begin to actually deal with the economic situation that we're facing as, a, as, yeah. a, as an economic... Well, a huge part of mainstream economic theory is, is to say that uh, government spending burdens future generations. Mm. And I actually, one of my Twitter correspondents put it beautifully just recently um, about that, saying that a, a burden on future generations implies that building a, like a, a nuclear power plant now will burden future generations. But he said future generations don't have to put labour in in 30 years' time to make a power station now. That's assuming time travel, mm. okay? So when you put it in, in real physical terms, it's nonsense to say future generations are burdened by what we do now. If we build a, power, a nuclear power station now, that's going to reduce the carbon load for the future generations or a solar power, whatever it might be. Um, but they have this vision that they've got to pay it back in the future. And this is where you start getting into the absolute lunacy of mainstream economic thinking. And again, people don't see this because they read newspaper versions which 
the journalists don't understand it, so they, they, they accept what The Economist says. You read textbooks which sanitise all the stuff. If you read the original articles, they are off with the bloody fairies. And my favourite here, and one of, I've got many favourites, but Robert Barrow is the person who gave birth what they call Ricardian equivalents. And Barrow started by saying that uh, government deficit now necessarily means in a, so a government, government yeah, deficit now which is spending more than it takes in taxes, necessarily means an equivalent surplus in the future in their present value terms. So therefore, if the government runs a deficit, people will decide to spend less to pay those future taxes. Now that's nonsense enough in itself, <laughs> but he got a few objections from, from, um, from seminar participants about that. So he said, one of the objections I got was, what if people expect those taxes to be levied after they've died, won't they spend more anyway and ignore it? And he said, this, this argument fails if we assume that current generations save to enable their descendants to pay out of benevolence. <laughs> now, here's an economic theory based on selfishness, using benevolence as a reason to say, in fact, we'll save so that future generations, you know, in three or four hundred years, can pay the taxes we anticipate to happen out there. Somebody who said, you're a lunatic. That's nonsense. Throw it out. Instead, now it becomes part of the accepted literature, and Ricardian equivalence becomes an argument they used against government running deficits now. And they get even more extreme than that. And they had the argument that they called uh, ex expansionary fiscal uh, um, expansionary fiscal contraction, arguing that because we know the government's being responsible now, we'll feel better and spend more because they're running a surplus. So a government surplus will be counteracted by more than. It is garbage. It is childish intellectual games. And that's the foundation of mainstream economic theory, which is it's no wonder why the currency crisis is coming. So we are in the situation where we've got the biggest amount of debt in the world, right? Probably ever. Um, um, in terms of global level yeah, of, of yeah. outstanding debt, including if you add how I, I don't agree with alien government debt in there. Right. But unless when you do do it, yes, yeah. that's true. Uh, and we know in Australia, we've got household debt, you know, absolutely as high as it's ever been. Highest in our history and the second highest on the planet right now, yeah. only to Switzerland, though I'm sure given these recent stimulus will exceed Switzerland, <laughs> and the third highest in history, the only country having a higher level of household debt to GDP being Denmark. Yeah. So I guess my question, Steve, is, you know, what are the alternatives from this point? We, know we are where we are, right? Yeah. And clearly just doing more debt stuff is not going to solve anything. Yeah. It's just going to move the can down the road and mm. it's going to increase, increase the size of the problem later. So, so then people sort of throw out things like, well, MMT, or they throw out things like, um, uh, you know, debt forgiveness. And you know, w w what are the sort of the alternative strategies that, that are actually out there? Well, the one that I've been putting for about a decade now, and I haven't put enough work into developing it fully, is what I call a modern debt jubilee. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at ancient societies, um, go back to right, the Sumerian civilization, which was the first really advanced, you know, large-scale human hierarchical society, uh, they, every, um, the, the dilemma for them was that the only people who could fight in the Sumerian army were freemen. And what would happen is that households would run up debt, business debt would occur as well, household debt would be run up, and it often was run up in alehouses, strangely enough, was <laughs> alcohol on credit that led to people having pay, taken out too much credit, they couldn't repay it. So what they do, they became debt slaves. They have to go and work on the properties of the alehouse owners. So you, and this is you know, this is going back five thousand years. It's sure. a totally different society. But what it meant was gradually over time, the number of people who could be who could be volunteers to fight and defend the empire was declining. So the Sumerian uh, emperor had two choices: lose the empire or kill the kill, kill the um, uh, the debt. Um, one of two ways you do that, you either execute the moneylenders, which happened on a few occasions, <laughs> or you institute regular debt jubilees. And the debt jubilee, when they occurred, uh, would be either the, the next ruler or 49 years. Okay? And that was built into the system. Now, it, it wasn't a forgiveness of all debts. Business debts were not forgiven. Okay? And that's valid because people took on business debt for sensible reasons. They had cash flow to finance it and so on. It was household debts that were forgiven. So, and what that would mean is people who were debt slaves were, had, had to leave their own property. Their own property probably, I don't know this for sure, but it probably became part of the operations of the person they were in debt to. When the debt jubilee struck, they were liberated from working for the effectively slave owner they were part thereof, 
went back and worked on their own properties again, and that would happen every 49 years. And you know, again, Mark, Michael Hudson's done most of the work on this, and the person who's translated these cuneiforms is Cornelia Wunsch. Uh, and Cornelia found that you would see them using um, fractions, mathematics of fractions, to show that there would be an exponential increase in debt, but only a sort of sigmoidal increase in productivity of the land, and then a dot, 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 restarted again. Right. So debt jubilees were, was a conventional part of human societies right up to the Roman period. Um, now I've said we need a modern debt jubilee because when you look at debt and you see that debt is actually created by banks, okay, debt is not me lending to you and therefore you don't repay me, I get ripped off. It's debt banks saying, that's a great idea, Martin. Here's a million dollars for the house you want to buy in Thrill. And by the way, you owe us a million dollars, creating it out of nothing, but doing it because they expect house prices and thrill to rise indefinitely, which them living a mythical world, lending for the wrong purposes, inflating bubbles. Um, you can reset that because just as the, the banks can create money by lending, governments create money by spending more than they get back in taxes and financing that by bond, bond issue and sales to the, uh, to the financial sector or you know, they can outright create the money. This is the important point that MMT makes, that government is not restrained by the amount of money because they can create money just as banks do. So you can use the government's money creation capacity to cancel private debt. And my idea is to... We know that private central banks have been creating money for QE. Mm. In America, they've been creating a trillion dollars per year while they were doing QE. Simply stroke of the pen, they say, we're putting a, a, billion, a trillion dollars in your bank accounts, the financial sector, that, and that with that trillion dollars, we're buying a trillion dollars worth of bonds from you every year for 10 years. Now, who remembers paying a QE tax? <laughs> okay, no one. It was done by the double entry bookkeeping capabilities of the central bank and the fact that we, in America, you accept American dollars, in Australia, you accept Australian dollars. The central bank has that capacity. So the central bank could create money and put it in everybody's bank accounts. My idea is to say that you give everybody the same amount of money. If they're in debt, then it's an offset to their debt, okay, which reduces the debt burden. If they're not in debt, they get a cash injection. You could also put conditions on that. I would, uh, you, because you've got to, if you injected that much money into the economy in one go, you'd cause a huge boost to inflation. Mm. I would uh, add the provision that when that money is injected into accounts of people who don't have any debt themselves, then the only thing they can do with that money is buy shares where those shares have been issued by companies specifically to pay down corporate debt. And what you get out of that is a reduction in corporate debt as well as a reduction in household debt. And you'd also democratise share ownership, which is because QE has made share ownership massively more unequal because the wealthy who own shares now have had their share prices driven up, uh, while the poor who don't have just become even less relatively rich compared to the ultra-rich. So you democratise share ownership, provide money for corporations and reduce the debt burden in the economy fundamentally by accounting operations. And then we could keep on going with a far lower level of debt and I think as a result of that we'd have far more demand coming out of the circulation of existing money because at the moment if you're in debt you don't want to spend because you're worried about the level of debt you're carrying. Well what that means is a lower level of demand from the turnover of existing money and that turns up in the data. Mm, okay, so just further on MMT, because yeah. we've covered MMT a couple of times on the DFA channel, yeah. right? And we, we, we had somebody from Adelaide who was very much in favour of Stephen? MMT. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think he made a very good set of arguments yeah, as, he's to, good. Yeah. as to why MMT, you know, could work. You know, don't think of government debt as the same as household debt. It's not the same. It's got a different yeah. purpose and all those things. Yeah. And then we have other people on the other side of the equation say, but debt is debt is debt. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, we can't go on blowing the debt up forever. So... Uh, I'm interested in this sort of contention between, if you like, those two schools, yeah, right? Because yeah. they do seem to me put, to be pulling in quite different directions. Yeah. Um, how, how do you see it? I'm like in the strict accounting sense. You know, I've invented a software package called Minsky for yeah. monetary modelling yeah. that I can do all this and in, in, in simulate and yeah. turn and see the, the roles. Yeah. Uh, the government has no limit to its capacity to create debt mm. and no limit to capacity to service debt so long as it's issuing debt in its own currency. Uh, because even though the central bank by law, not by necessity but by law, can't buy bonds directly off the treasury, what happens is the treasury issues bonds to 
covered the gap between what it expects its tax revenue to be, what it expects its expenditure to be, issues bonds for the gap. As soon as a supply is approved by the parliament, certainly in the Australian case, the British and I think the American as well, as soon as it's approved, that money is regarded as being in Treasury's account. So Treasury can spend as soon as the approval bill goes through. Then the Treasury sells those bonds. They're bought by the finance sector. There's never been an issue of government bonds that has been undersubscribed, 100% plus demand for them because they want that asset in their portfolio. That then finances government spending. And equally, one thing which is an essential element of a, of a private bank is that to be, to be a private bank, your equity must be positive. So your assets minus your liabilities must be a positive sum. That's why so many banks went bankrupt during the financial crisis, because assets included shares and assets included bonds they had on their books, which were plunging in value. And while their assets were falling, the liabilities were constant, so their equity is falling with the fall on the asset values. Paulson, you might remember, took a telephone call from the head of Morgan Stanley, I think it was, and said, look, you've got to do something. We're, we're, we're in danger of going bankrupt. And Paulson asked, how long have you got? And he said, about three hours. <laughs> okay, so it can collapse like that. Yep. Now, on the other hand, the central bank can operate with negative equity because effectively the central bank's um, mode of foul is that its money is accepted in the nation itself. So long as the nation as a whole is functioning as, an, as a you know, functioning economy, you can run negative equity and nobody even knows. Mm. And you can actually, and this, this happened in the UK about two years ago, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer gifted bonds to the central bank, to the Bank of England, to make it, give it a large amount of positive equity. So this is all accounting operations. So in that sense, the, there's no restraint, no constraint the government faces uh, in creating money and therefore servicing its debt as well. Um, but, I think the, the other issue about it that I, where I'd start breaking away from MMT is that they do, do not pay sufficient attention to the level of private debt. Right. And there's a recent debate by uh, a guy called Doug, uh, Doug Henwood came out with an attack on MMT and he was replied to by Randy Ray and like the language was not good in either direction. <laughs> uh, but at one stage, Doug said that MMT doesn't pay sufficient attention to credit. And Randy agreed and says, yes, we don't... Re the, the, the whole argument about endogenous money really just to simply establish that the, uh, the central bank doesn't control the money supply, which is moving the, like the moving the supply, it controls the price. That's all it comes down to. So they haven't yet realised what I've realised, that credit is part of aggregate demand. Yeah. And so they don't pay enough attention to the private debt level. And um, the government debt, I think they don't pay sufficient attention to that in the context of countries running trade deficits because they have an argument about trade deficits being a good thing and I think that's categorically wrong. So I break away from them at that point and I would rather have, uh, I would rather use this, I'd, I'd rather acknowledge that saying government debt is debt is a misnomer because it's really the balancing item of the government money creation, and we could call it equity, mm. okay? Uh, the government could literally write off the debt that it owes or to redeclare that as being equity and pay dividends to people who own what they'd now call shares in the country. Uh, it's, it's not the same thing as private debt because they can't run out of money and they create the bonds as well as creating the money. Mm. So I'm... I, I share within the lack of concern about government debt. Uh, I think I'm worrying more about private debt, and I think we should use the capacity of the government to reduce private debt, but also to renominate and effectively what they currently call government debt as government equity in the economy. Okay, very interesting. So uh, clearly, the Reserve Bank is saying, well, we've cut interest rates, right? Mm they would like the government to spend more on infrastructure and those yep. sorts of things. But they've also left the door open to quantitative easing and maybe even yep. negative interest rates and those sorts of things, mm -hmm. right? Following similar trends from the US and from elsewhere, Japan, of course, and Europe is already in negative interest rate territory. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion as to this sort of, you know, QE negative interest rate domain that seemed to be, if you like, flavour of the month at the moment? QE um, inflates asset prices. Mm -hmm. It makes the wealthy better off. And the poor buggers have suffered so badly during the previous credit boom. Uh, 
So it actually increases one of the problems that the debt bubble itself causes of rising inequality. This is partly one of my um, distinct elements of my own analysis is that when I build my models of uh, complex systems models of the economy, I found, and this was, was what they call an emergent property of the model, that even in my models, if I have the private sector, the, the corporate sector borrowing the money, the corporate sector's share of GDP fluctuates pretty much on a flat line. As the private debt level rises, workers' share falls. So the complex dynamics of income distribution in a capitalist economy mean that rising debt means a falling workers' share. So that's rising inequality coming out of it. The last thing I want to do is make that worse again by QE, which boosts the Money, the, the, the wealth levels of those who own shares, which includes both the capitalists and the bankers. Mm. So I think it's completely the wrong policy. It works in a very, very mediocre way for the real economy, because if you, when you, what QE involves is buying bonds of all description, government bonds and also private bonds, off the private financial sector. Yep. So it's, it's, in America, it was a trillion dollars a year. It means that they're handing over a trillion dollars of income earning bonds to the government and they're getting a trillion dollars of cash instead. They can't buy bonds because the government's bought all the bonds. So what do they do? They buy shares. Yep. Even at the simple you know, transfer of wealth uh, across, you could say, well, that might drive up share values by a trillion dollars a year. And then people who've sold those shares to the banks, whose money also stays in the banking sector, have now got a trillion dollars more in cash themselves. They might spend 900 billion of that buying yet more shares further driving up share prices, and maybe a hundred billion buying the odd Lamborghini or yacht and everything else and hiring a few working class slavs to do to clean the cars and man the boats for them. So for every trillion in, you might get a hundred billion into the real economy. And yes, that has boosted economic activity, but an enormous cost in terms of huge, far more money than they needed to give, it's being spent far more slowly because they give it to the rich rather than to the poor, mm -hmm. and end up increasing inequality because they make the rich richer. So I think it is a brainless activity, and I'm sure the Reserve Bank will go straight to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, well, uh, I, I've been noticing the broad money. I yeah. don't know whether you've noticed, but yeah. as, as it, it, it was dipping end of last year, it started to grow. Mm -hmm. right? At a time when the rate of credit is continuing to decline. Okay. So my theory is there's something going on below the waterline, yeah. which is actually allowing broad money to grow. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a theory, you know, I haven't yet proved it, that maybe the Reserve Bank is doing a few things behind the scenes. Um, and I begin well, to I mean, the, bank, the Reserve Bank is always involved in what we call open yeah. market operations. Correct. Oh, yeah. that's okay. Yes. So um, it's, what, what QE is, is a promise by the central bank, whichever country we're talking about, to be on the net buy side to the tune of, in America's case, a trillion dollars per year yeah. through OMO. Yeah. Now, it's also quite possible for the Reserve Bank to be on the positive side of AMO operations without actually making that a declared objective overall. Yep. And if the economy is suffering, declining a bit, and banks themselves are complaining about credit shortage and so on, and their own equ equity levels getting tricky, then the central bank will do that. So that's quite possibly one of the mechanisms. The other could also be, of course, increasing iron ore prices, <laughs> meaning we've got a trade surplus for the first time in yes. decades, yes. and that would also be turning up in broad money. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I was, of course, the BBSW rate has dived. Yeah, you know, whereas through last year it was much higher than it had been for quite some time. Yeah, and again, I wonder whether those two things are somewhat connected too. Quite possibly. Yeah. I mean, again, I haven't, I, I, I don't pay much attention to the Reserve Bank these days. <laughs> um, my focus is relaxed on ecological issues and into mm. rather than monetary now because I've mm. seen. I mean, I thought economists stuffed up the monetary system. <laughs> They've been experts on money compared to what they've done in the terms of ecology, which really scares right. the hell out of me. Right. But yes, yeah, so in terms of the, the Reserve Bank could well be in that situation here. So thanks very much, Steve. Let's draw this conversation to a close. But perhaps next time we can touch further on the whole question of ecology and energy. Thank you very much. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. See you again next time.